three score and ten years ago, <laughs> our physics depart department brought forth on this campus a new laboratory conceived in space physics and dedicated to the proposition that all space science should be interdisciplinary. <laughs> now we are engaged in a great competition testing whether that laboratory or any laboratory so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. With apologies to Abraham Lincoln, I'll now stop this tortured parody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Abraham. Um, I hope that in the prior four hours, most of you have had the chance to enjoy the food, the refreshments, and the tours of LASP Science Engineering Management. And I want to welcome every LASP member, every family member, every friend and visitor here today. I want to especially thank uh, Tom Mason, Tom Sparn, Randy Siders who have helped put together the talk I'm going to give today. Um, this is an impossible task to take 70 years of, a, of amazing achievement and to try to uh, fit that into uh, 45 minutes or so. But I will, uh, I'll do my best to hit some of the high points and uh, I know that many of you are familiar with the book that has been published here. It's a very, very uh, brief kind of accounting of the 70 years. People who want to get some of the very early history might also look at this uh, massive tome about the Department of Physics. And this was uh, written by Albert Bartlett and Jack Kraschauer. And it recounts the history of the Physics Department from 1876 to 2001. It's quite an amazing thing. So last, the, uh, the early years, um, the University of Colorado Physics Department really did give rise to the uh, Upper Air Project that became the Upper Air Laboratory. This was to uh, undertake research with the Naval Research Lab and the Air Force. It was really looking to use the um, captured German V-2 rockets and other rockets to study the sun in the upper atmosphere. Um, of course, this developed into uh, instrumentation that was flown on these rocks. We'll talk more about that here. Um, in the mid-1950s, um, a group of, uh, of engineers, uh, it says started Ball Brothers Research. I think that I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think it was really Ball Brothers Research Corporation got started trying to convert other national security things into a money-making proposition and they stole engineers from, uh, from CU and this led to quite a, an exchange between uh, the president at that time and Ed Ball at, uh, at the Ball Corporation. Um, NASA was formed 10 years after the Upper Air Laboratory started and uh, of course then in the early years um, CU got funding from NASA and continued its work with the Air Force and uh, Navy as well. And then the upper air laboratory uh, changed into the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. Now the, the rockets that were available, uh, this is uh, s some of the diagrams that are available over in the Pioneer Center. But um, one of, if you look carefully at the one on the left here, it, it indicates that this is a picture from 1951. And the label, at least, is calling it last. At that time, I think that anticipated a little bit. But, um, but the use of these rockets was a revolutionary thing. On the right, you see the Airby rocket. You may recognize this as being similar to one that's hanging in the lobby over the, uh, the Space Technology Building. And the Airby rockets were really developed under with a team that was led by my old mentor, James Van Allen, who really began the uh, the Araby project and developed that in the in the 50s as well. Now this was a time of of uh, great leaderships and a theme that I want to make in this entire talk is that individuals matter, that people with passion and vision um, have over all this time really driven what's happened and how it's happened. Now the uh, the picture on the left here is a picture of the physics department chair, Lester, uh, giving a medal for 30 years of service to uh, William Peyton Paul, who was the PI on the first, uh, first grants that were received, the first funds that were received. And uh, in fact, in 1948, 
they received the princely sum of $69,000 to do the first investigations using um, rocket payloads to study the sun in the upper atmosphere. If you look at the picture on the right, this illustrates the, the breakthrough that was really made here, which was a biaxial pointing system, a way to take a spinning rocket that was spinning for stabilization and to try to make that able to uh, point the payload at a point in space like the sun or a uh, part of the atmosphere or so. They did pretty well in spelling perpendicular there, but misspelled equatorial, but uh, you know, um, uh, spelling isn't a forte of everyone. Now the, uh, the uh, team, of course, what consisted of a number of young engineers, and you see uh, Pete and Paul here again, and this is uh, a record of the uh, date and time for this V2 link study. And the, uh, the development then of the payload, the platforms, and they brought in uh, Frank Waltz uh, at that time then to join the team and to help manage the project for the, um, the development of the solar pointing system. These results were, uh, were excellent and it really led to people beating a path to the door of uh, CU uh, to, in order to get access to this kind of hardware. And it also, of course, established CU as a leader in solar research. And I guess uh, I'd like to comment here again that this, these were heady times here in the Boulder area. Um, in uh, the early, late 30s, really, or, uh, certainly early 40s, um, Walter R. Roberts was, uh, was a force to be reckoned with in this area. First, uh, as, as a, an outpost of Harvard at the Climax Molybdenum Mine in, near Leadville, established the High Altitude Observatory in, the, uh, in 46 or so. The Upper Air, air Laboratory uh, was not yet formed then, but the, uh, but the uh, High Altitude Observatory uh, became affiliated with the University of Colorado. And uh, Roberts, of course, for those who ever met him, was a force of nature and he was, uh, was a strong driver and I'm sure played a, a big role in the department, becoming uh, you know, enamored of the idea of studying the sun, not only from the ground and from high mountain altitudes, but also from rockets. And uh, Roberts went on to um, head the uh, Department of Astrogeophysics in the mid-50s and uh, continued and was the founding uh, director of NCAR as well. So he has played a huge role in um, the space sciences here in this area. During this same time, about this part, part of the early 50s, Lewis Branscom uh, was, uh, joined the National Bureau of Standards and ultimately he uh, formed uh, and, and led uh, the team that formed uh, the JILA lab that we know today. So these were times when there were real giants. William Rents, who was the director when uh, the Upper Air Laboratory became the, uh, the last laboratory, uh, came to the university in 1949 and he also, of course, was very active in the development of this rocket program. Now, there was another giant amongst uh, the, the people at that time. This was George Gamow, a great physicist, who apparently wasn't too happy with the way things were going in the physics building at that time. This is a cartoon that he sent to the vice president pointing out that uh, the physics building was uh, overcrowded, there was too much traffic, there were parking problems, um, <coughs> the computing had to be in a bad place out under a lean-to, I guess, and uh, the, the parking was handled by stacking cars, I gather, and uh, uh, he, uh, he indicated it was just getting worse. I think you could draw pretty much the same cartoon today, <laughs> and uh, uh, LASP uh, is pulled out at that time, so this and this looks a lot like the radome that we have over on our building now, so I hope this doesn't portend things. But um, the date on this is March 1964, so we know that by 1964, LAS certainly existed as a, as a, an affine uh, entity. Now, in uh, 1965, the the new building, Space Sciences Building, uh, opened. Uh, this was a time in the in the nation's history when. NASA was actually giving um, money for bricks and mortar efforts at the University of Chicago, the University of Iowa, Berkeley, 
several other places um, that there were facilities, buildings that were really built with NASA funds. And uh, Charles Barth gave me uh, some of the material about this. And uh, there was a, a grand opening in 1965. And this building was built for $729,000, as I recall the number. And um, this became the core, of course, of what is the Duane complex today. Now, uh, of course, not all the work was done um, in that building. Um, I guess there are people here today who probably remember 55th Street and the, I don't, I never saw, had the privilege of seeing this, but this is where a lot of the design work was done. But um, I'm going to try, uh, talk about many of the different kind of research elements here, but this is a, an eye chart that we, we use often to just show that uh, LASP has been involved in so many different areas of science, studying the sun, the planets, and back in these earliest days, uh, commencing in the mid-60s or so, there were typically one or two large uh, satellite programs, and uh, then uh, many, many uh, rocket launches, uh, typically during those, uh, those days. And uh, just to um, anticipate a little bit here, but if we look at things today, we have many projects on the left column talking about things that are in development or so, and planned and, and proposals in process, other things that are in development, and many that have been launched and are in early or operational stages. And I'm going to try to talk through in the very limited time here about many of these different programs and what they've meant and how they sort of tie back to the origin story that I've told you. So today LASP is doing research in planetary science and solar science and atmospheric science and space physics. LASP has had an extraordinary record of accomplishment with deep space missions, earth orbiting missions, rockets, balloons, and has, uh, has sent missions to many, many uh, locations in the uh, solar system and now beyond. But much of it starts with really uh, understanding the sun. And uh, in NASA, this, is, this discipline of space physics is called heliophysics. And uh, understanding the sun, of course, is crucial for understanding um, our world and the influences on our world, and LASP has become the leader in understanding this. Uh, the nuclear furnace at the center of the sun generating energy photons that may take 100,000 years or so to make their way out through the, uh, the inner two-thirds of the radiative zone, as it's called. The outer part of the sun is undergoing constant overturning kind of motion. The uh, equator rotates more rapidly than the poles. This kind of leads to differential motion of the plasmas, the gases in the sun, and this uh, gives rise to dynamo kind of action that can generate strong magnetic fields. The sun has uh, microscopic, almost from our point of view, regions of upwelling and downwelling. There can be regions of strong emergent magnetic flux that, uh, from sunspot groups. These are uh, regions that are of great importance because of the fact that these can lead to large solar storms that can affect our Earth environment. And I'll talk more about space weather here uh, later. But the, we're in a golden age of solar observations now, having beautiful uh, images, uh, very dynamic images of the sun, um, uh, seen in many different wavelengths understanding how those regions on the sun connect to the magnetic fields that emerge and how the disturbances from the sun can blast out in, in large uh, disturbances called coronal mass ejections that uh, should they be directed toward the earth can have profound effects again on our humans and, and human technology. The uh, images that are returned from these solar platforms today are giving us exquisite views of what's going on in the um, active regions. We can see solar flares such as you just saw there that are intense in x-rays. Uh, we can also see large blasts of material coming out and, and large loops of material coming out all affecting the earth in profound ways. But going back to the earliest days of, of LASP, building on the, uh, on the rocket experiments that uh, I mentioned before, uh, LASP became involved uh, under the leadership of 
Charles Barth and others who were, um, uh, were uh, leading the lab at that time became involved in some of the large solar missions that NASA put together. The orbiting solar observatory series was a spectacular example of this with instruments to measure all the properties of the sun from, from above the Earth's atmosphere. And, uh, and the OSO-5 measurements from LAST provided key observations in the ultraviolet. And LAST became prominent and, and extremely well known for its work across the UV part of the, of the spectrum. Uh, the, uh, the work on uh, the early solar missions led to, um, uh, pretty directly, to an interest, in, an increasing interest, let's say, in understanding the sun and how it affected the uh, layers of the Earth's atmosphere. And a key watershed uh, program for LAST was the Solar Mesosphere Explorer, SME. And uh, here it's uh, very worth te uh, telling the story that uh, SME, I believe, was initiated under the infamous uh, announcement of Opportunity 6 and 7 back in the 1970s. And uh, Noel Hinners tells the story of the kind of lobbying that he was subjected to for people to be selected in, under that announcement of opportunity. And he mentioned particularly Charlie Barth going to his hotel room. They were at a meeting together and Charlie was pounding on the door uh, trying to get Noel's attention and telling him how important it was for industry and universities to work together to study uh, in this opportunity to study the sun and its influence on the atmosphere. And here's a picture of Charles Barth, of course, and uh, this was a partnership between Ball Aerospace and, um, and uh, LASP. Now, I, I should have mentioned uh, a bit more about the, the ball uh, formation and the fact that those guys went there and they did um, uh, really the founding work in establishing the, the Ball Aerospace Company. But Ball has been one of the closest and most uh, valued partners with LASP over these many years. And um, I think we continue to um, have this kind of relationship where we sometimes compete and we sometimes cooperate, but we are also always respectful of one another. And SME was, I believe at that time, a very good example of how the university could build the scientific instruments and Ball could build the the uh, bus that carried those instruments and together this was an extraordinary success. This was also when LASP got heavily into using students in the role of uh, mission operations and I think uh, uh, Karen Simmons is here and Tom Sparn and uh, David Stern and many others who participated, uh, Randy Davis, others who were around at those times can really testify to the importance of this university-led mission. And this was a, this set the tone for the so-called PI class missions that uh, is with us until the present day. Another watershed moment for LAST was is when I came here in the mid-90s, um, Gary Rotman, Tom Woods, and others had gone over to uh, NCAR to HAO. And, uh, Gary and Tom and company came back to LASP in the mid-90s uh, and they brought their passion for doing advanced uh, solar uh, observations to LASP and back to LASP I should say and, uh, and uh, we're in the stage of developing the, the source mission solar radiation and climate experiment and this is where uh, George Lawrence working with, uh, with Gary and others really developed the instrumentation to measure much more precisely the total energy coming from the sun. And this really, I think, was a revolutionary step. And uh, SOURCE continues to operate to this day and uh, has uh, given the definitive answer as to how much energy is coming from the sun and hitting the Earth and how that's affecting the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere and climate. And of course, uh, moving even further forward, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is the first of the NASA Living with the Star missions. It has been an extraordinary success. Tom Woods and his team have uh, built uh, the definitive instruments to measure the uh, uh, properties of the sun. And this mission is, was the first of the NASA Living with a Star program. 
and uh, it, has, it has exceeded all expectations of returning huge volumes of data. And it is one that uh, where rockets are still used to make pre very precise underflights and calibrations of the instruments on board this and other of the UV instruments we're flying in space. And of course, most, most recently, uh, assault on the sun is the Parker Solar Probe, named after Eugene Parker. Uh, this mission was launched in August of this year, and uh, um, I will now repeat the tired joke, how can you fly so close to the sun? And the answer is that you do the mission at night. Um, uh, okay, some people hadn't heard that before. Um, I, I hope that the, the spacecraft doesn't in fact plunge quite that far into the sun, but it is an extraordinary thing. And David Malaspina, uh, Bob Ergen, uh, Scott Tucker and others have done an extraordinary job here. And uh, this is going to fly multiple times near the sun and uh, is going to uh, provide uh, fascinating new insights into how the solar wind is accelerated and, and the processes that ultimately are of, of such immense interest for uh, both from a space weather and a, a scientific standpoint. Now the other end of the system, away from the sun, but looking more at the Earth, earthward end, again LASP has been an, uh, an extraordinary contributor to the science associated with this, uh, this aspect. And of course, uh, this is a picture of the Earth, the magnetic field emerging from the Earth that uh, ultimately forms the region we call the magnetosphere. And we've learned over these uh, many years that the cartoons that are drawn in the books of very smooth laminar kind of interactions are anything but, that the boundaries are constantly uh, shifting and changing the interaction between the flowing uh, gases from the sun, the solar wind, and the uh, interaction with the magnetosphere lead to boundaries, but they're very, uh, very highly fluctuating boundaries. And within the magnetospheric system, we've learned vastly more since the beginning of LASP. Uh, we've learned about the cold plasmas that control so much of the wave properties in the system, about the extraterrestrial ring current that shapes and distorts the magnetic fields around the Earth, and of course the Van Allen radiation belts that I'll talk more about. Uh, the, uh, the flow of the solar wind past the uh, Earth's magnetosphere is very fast, supersonic, super Um It lo can load energy into the windsock or comet-like tail, and uh, that energy can play a very important role. This energy is, uh, the en entrance of this energy into the system is controlled very much by the uh, orientation of the interplanetary magnetic field and under the right, under the right circumstances the gate can open and allow energy to flow in in very large quantities and this can lead to powerful geomagnetic storms that uh, pump energy down into the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere especially in the polar regions and this can uh, energize the uh, gases in the inner part of the magnetosphere but it's especially visible in the form of the aurora that uh, can uh, be seen uh, sometimes here in Colorado, but uh, very often at more northern latitudes and southern latitudes. And these aurora are, have been fascinating humans since uh, humans first appeared on the Earth, I'm sure. And um, again, the probes like Van Allen Belt uh, storm probes, uh, known as the Van Allen probes, and the magnetospheric multiscale that we're heavily involved in now are answering questions about that and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But uh, the, uh, the exploration of the uh, Earth and its, uh, the influence that the Sun has on the Earth's atmosphere ionosphere system has been uh, very uh, actively studied. I think another uh, key development was uh, in the mid-90s with the development of the student nitric oxide explorer. This was a a challenge that was laid down by um, NASA and by the University Space Research Association to go back to the future in a sense to see whether small inexpensive spacecraft with strong student involvement could really be, um, uh, whether missions like that could be achieved. There were three selected. The only one that really uh, worked was the University of Colorado one led by Charles Barth and uh, strong involvement of Stan Solomon and many other Others here in the room, again, with a strong involvement of Ball engineers. And this was uh, uh, developed, launched in uh, 1998. It would have been a success if it had operated for a few weeks. It operated for nearly six years. 
and a train to many, uh, uh, many young uh, scientists and engineers, some of whom may see themselves in this picture and uh, now uh, a couple of decades on. But Snowy was uh, an extraordinary success and once again demonstrated that a dedicated team could do amazing things and that LASP in particular was, uh, was unparalleled in its ability to accomplish uh, essentially impossible things. To building all of this for three and a half million dollars and returning uh, outstanding scientific data was a, a, great, a great achievement and I think has led very directly to the things that we're doing today and uh, our commitment to building um, uh, innovative spacecraft for innovative purposes. Another uh, important, uh, very important mission um, that uh, has been returning fascinating data since its launch in 2007 is the Aeronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere AIM mission. Uh, Dave Rush and uh, Cora Randall, Lynn Harvey, many have been working on this uh, program. Uh, the, uh, this was led by Jim Russell, is led by Jim Russell at Hampton University, but LASP has played a, a central role in so many respects. And the, um, this was where LASP really got heavily into building imaging kind of systems and uh, these beautiful pictures of the, that we see here of uh, noctilucent clouds are, have now been um, imaged from above and we're getting much deeper understanding of the uh, sensitive climate change uh, that goes on at these uh, altitudes near the mesos mesopause up at 80 or 85 kilometers altitude, the coldest part of the Earth's atmosphere. The magnetospheric multiscale I mentioned before, uh, Bob Bergen, I think came here in 99, brought uh, his knowledge and expertise about measuring electric fields in space and uh, working along with with his team and working with uh, Jim Birch and the team from Southwest Research. The Magnetospheric Multiscale launched in 2015 has made extraordinary uh, achievements in measuring in very precise detail the characteristics of the process of magnetic reconnection that I mentioned before, understanding how magnetic energy is converted into particle energy. And we're of course also doing the operations, the science operations for MMS here at LASP. And uh, again, one can trace this um, extraordinary skill in operations right back to the uh, initial experience that we had back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, with, especially with SME. Now I mentioned space weather. Um, I guess in some ways I've been involved with space weather before it was called space weather, but I've been interested for most of my career in the question of how the powerful disturbances from the sun can really affect uh, human uh, technologies. People often tell me what other kind of technology is there but human technology, but I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll just say that uh, we're very interested in how these disturbances that I talked about from the sun, these powerful blasts that may be moving seven or eight million miles an hour, 10 billion tons of material colliding with the Earth's magnetic uh, protective envelope, again driving these powerful currents, in the, especially in the higher latitudes. These currents can couple into long conductors like pipelines and power lines. They can uh, lead to uh, immense uh, and uh, great heating in large transformers, for example, can knock out transformers, can lead to massive power blackouts, one of the great concerns for space weather, but also can adversely affect the ionosphere and hence affect high frequency communication that relies on the ionosphere for signals to bounce off of can affect the uh, transmission of signals through the ionosphere, affecting systems like GPS that our society depends on in, in countless ways today. Billions of dollars of industry associated with this. And this affects then precision agriculture, navigation at sea, and so many other uh, things where GPS plays a key role. Space weather can affect individual spacecraft or constellations of spacecraft. It can uh, cause discharges within electronics on board spacecraft can cause degradation of the solar panels and can even be a major risk for humans on the space station and of course will be a major concern for humans flying uh, to other destinations such as back to the moon or to Mars. So space weather is something that is increasingly of concern. It's a hazard that affects all the um, advanced nations of the world. Now. Um, 
LASP had not been particularly known for measuring uh, energetic particles uh, in earlier times, but uh, with the uh, announcement of opportunity for the uh, radiation belt storm probes, um, my colleague who's now at Goddard, uh, Sri Conical and I, really wanted to make sure that we uh, had the chance to uh, join this team and propose to measure the highest energy particles in the radiation belts. And um, so working with uh, Jim Westfall and Vaughn Hoxie, uh, we went back and looked at all the things that had bothered us about um, energetic particle instrumentation in earlier times, so all the instruments we tried to work with before. We tried to correct every one of those things. And with knockdown, drag out discussions with Jim and Vaughn, I think we built the best instruments that have ever flown for this purpose, the relativistic electron proton telescopes. These were um, successfully uh, developed and integrated onto the uh, Van Allen probes, the radiation belt storm probes. They were launched in 2012 and uh, have been working flawlessly and continuously since that time on the dual spacecraft. On the right hand side here you see we're looking down on top of the system, we're looking down on top of the earth and uh, by measuring measurements along the highly elliptical orbits here you can make uh, in situ measurements and you can map those around to give a picture of what's going on all the way around the earth. And So there are three pi sectors here about uh, a total of one day apart. On, on this sector it's before a coronal mass ejection uh, solar storm hit the magnetosphere. The radiation belts are rather diffuse and broad. The radiation belt particles are virtually all wiped out in, uh, in almost a, a, a you know, blink of an eye. And then as quickly as they disappeared, they reappear in a much more intense and localized fashion. And so the, uh, the REPT instruments have revealed wholly new things about the radiation belts, things that we thought we understood from 50 or 60 years ago are now much more clearly revealed by these measurements that have been made by the LASP instrumentation. And this uh, has led uh, directly to um, subsequent um, aggressive smaller missions. Um, our friend and colleague, I hope he's back here by now, uh, Shin Lin uh, Lee has uh, led the I arguably the most successful CubeSat mission that's flown. Uh, this is the Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment flying a miniature version of REPT called the REPT Integrated Little Experiment or Reptile, which I think is a very clever name. <laughs> and uh, Reptile has uh, contributed mightily to understanding and complementing uh, our studies of the radiation belts with the Van Allen probes. And uh, you probably see the uh, McGuckin's tape measure here for the antenna. And uh, this was done in a very uh, cost-effective way, very strong involvement of students. And I think the LASP is now involved in probably a dozen or more CubeSats. And this is a really a wave of the future. The, the uh, planetary story for LASP is a marvelous one, of course. Um, we talked about Mariner 5 at uh, Venus and Mariner 6 and 7 at Mars. And uh, I was recalling with uh, Stein today the, uh, the first um, information that came from these missions back in the, um, in the 70s was really, six, late 60s really, was, uh, was extremely big news. And, uh, and uh, again, Charles Barth coming from JPL, bringing his passionate interest in, in planetary uh, science missions uh, really led these things. And you may have, um, all of you have probably seen the, the engineering model of the Mariner. A Mars Mariner spacecraft in the other building, but uh, these uh, these observations uh, were uh, crucial and uh, really showed that Mars was a very different world than many had imagined it to be. And of course, uh, the planetary exploration um, of the outer of the outer solar system has been spearheaded by Voyager, that's flown by all of the outer planets except Pluto, and uh, and again had. Uh, huge involvement from uh, from LASP with the uh, UV systems, and um, return uh, the Voyagers, as many of you know, have been the first objects to really make it into the local interstellar medium, and are continuing to send back data here, some 40 years beyond their launch date. And uh, the uh, exploration of Mercury is another, I think, great success story. 
Uh, Bill McClintock and Mark Langton built this uh, beautiful instrument, the masks instrument. I think because of our strong friendship and cooperation with Tom Kermegis and the folks at the Applied Physics Laboratory, we were able to get in on the ground floor working as, uh, as co-investigators with them on the messenger mission. And to be able to fly a small discovery class mission that had a dozen or so instruments on board and could make very comprehensive measurements of the surface, the uh, exosphere, and the magnetosphere of Mercury has been a, a tremendous success. And this was launched in 2004. It took a number of years, to, uh, some seven years to get to Mercury, and then uh, made uh, beautiful observations that I think will stand the test of time. And Cassini, uh, a marvelous uh, program, and I, I hope many of you had the chance to see Larry Esposito's uh, tour de force talk over at Fisk Planetarium just this past Monday, but it was a, a beautiful talk about the uh, UV observations, the UVs observations at Mercury, uh, excuse me, at Saturn, but also uh, talking about the uh, well, the wide range of, uh, of science that's, that's been explored, this, uh, this award-winning picture in the UV of the rings of Saturn, uh, the deep understanding about the moons of Saturn, the role that they play, and, uh, and just this whole program was uh, uh, just a marvelous one to be involved in. And I was delighted to see the launch and uh, saddened to see the end of, of Cassini. And then uh, Mars, uh, of course, uh, MAVEN has been uh, a marvelous success, and uh, Bruce and, and the entire team are to be greatly uh, congratulated for this uh, amazing achievement. But again, I think one can trace MAVEN directly back to the earliest of the mariners and, and the fascination and the commitment to studying Mars that LASP has had over these uh, many decades. And of course, MAVEN has been showing, uh, this animation uh, sort of shows the idea of taking an originally probably uh, wet planet with a dense atmosphere and watching that evolve and uh, see the processes by which the atmosphere has been stripped away over the eons uh, has been crucially important. And uh, MAVEN continues to be successful and hope will be for many, many years to come. The student dust counter, uh, I, hope, um, I hope many of you had the chance to go over and see the dust accelerator lab. Um, just a very brief thumbnail sketch about this, uh, this program or about the dust, cosmic dust program here. Uh, Mihai came to me uh, probably 20 years ago and said, um, there's really an opportunity to sort of pick up a lot of the things that were be going on at the University of Colorado with John, uh, University of Chicago with uh, John Simpson and Tony Tosolino. Uh, and one of the first things was to build an improved electronic system for one of the dust counters. George Lawrence did that. And Mihai and team um, have uh, really become the leaders throughout the world, I would say, in uh, cosmic dust detection studies. And uh, now with Sasha and Zoltan and Mihai, they're, um, they're riding high on many, many missions. And the pseudo mission that's going to go to, um, to Europa is going to be revolutionary in its ability to understand the uh, properties of the uh, water and, and uh, salt compounds and so on that are coming out of the, in the plumes at Europa. But, um, this all started with an investment of a few tens of thousands of dollars of our very precious internal development research funding. And uh, I couldn't be more pleased and proud of the work that this team has done over the, the past couple of decades. And of course, uh, many of you have uh, had the chance to see today the EMM spacecraft being developed in close collaboration with the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in the UAE. And this is uh, another mission that is going to, I think, uh, answer key questions that have simply not been answered by other missions to Mars. And so that the fact that we can build on the Mariner to MAVEN to EMM and, and hopefully beyond and have developed this Astrolabe bus, which holds the potential for low cost and effective missions uh, to many other destinations is quite extraordinary. So planetary exploration uh, certainly has to be considered one of the great fortes of, uh, of LASP um, with missions to 
Mercury to Venus. The Earth is a planet, for those of you who have forgotten that, and so uh, we, we live in uh, a planet that is alleged to have life, and uh, intelligent life, I should say. And, um, and uh, we, uh, of course, are also um, expecting to continue uh, the gold mission, uh, a recent extraordinary success, uh, Laddie at the moon, the sequence of uh, programs at Mars that, uh, that have pushed back the frontiers of understanding there, the, uh, the uh, exploration of uh, Jupiter and with, uh, I haven't had time to talk so much about the Voyager results there or the Galileo results there, but amazing. And uh, Saturn and the Voyager pushing on beyond that to Uranus and Neptune. And of course the uh, amazing results that uh, everyone is, has become very familiar with with New Horizons and it now moves on to other bodies out in the Kuiper Belt. So this is the catchphrase for last, but sent instruments to every planet in the solar system and beyond. There have been many, many things one could point to that have enabled this. Uh, some of you may remember some of these technologies. I uh, saw Phil Evans earlier. He remembers many of these and probably put them in place. Um, the, um, some of these things uh, bring, make you sort of cringe when you think about how, the things you used in order to accomplish the scientific results back in those days. But moving to more modern platforms and um, we should never forget about the silicon life forms here in LASP that have done so much for us and uh, I think we should all at some point give a, a round of applause to all the silicon uh, that has uh, given its life uh, for us and for our science. But here we are, we're celebrating the 70th anniversary. Um, this is where LASP fits into the bigger picture of the university and the ecosystem here in the Front Range uh, today. Um, we, uh, we, of course, have highlighted LASP here, but the uh, JILA, I guess it's no longer the Joint Institute, it's just JILA. Ceres, our sister uh, research institution studying the, um, the Earth and its environment affiliated with NOAA, JILA with NIST. Uh, the other, the many departments with which LASP is affiliated. And we've had some other extraordinary successes. Uh, the long time partnership with NASA that's been mentioned, the uh, warm and, and very uh, enduring partnership with NCAR, with the uh, NOAA labs, uh, with the Space Weather Prediction Center. I was delighted to see Ernie Hildner here. and. Uh, Stein and I were talking today about when we first started thinking about the possibility of the National Solar Observatory coming here, and that was back uh, probably over a decade ago. And the Boulder Solar Alliance that really got together and put together the, the, the bid that really brought the National Solar Observatory here. And so now, going back from the earliest days with Walter Orr Roberts to ha having Boulder become the center of the universe, you might say, almost as with respect to solar research, is really quite a, an amazing thing. This is being accomplished in the facilities that you had the chance to tour today, going from the rather modest um, Duane Physics origins back in the uh, early days to now the LSTB, the annex that added immense capability bringing on board the Space Science Building, the uh, Dust Accelerator Lab, and uh, now in the Astrophysics Research Lab as well to be able to have facilities for space research that are unparalleled, I would say, in the uh, academic world anywhere in this nation or anywhere in the world probably. And the, uh, the advancement of uh, technical capabilities, um, all the ranging, uh, ranging from things on the ground and balloon and aircraft uh, systems that I had, haven't had too much chance to talk about, the suborbital, things in low Earth orbit, uh, geostationary orbit, lunar and deep space, um, having the ability to do instruments, spacecraft, components, working now with launch vehicles and, and mission operations and it's, it's really a, an amazing thing, and over this uh, seven decade period, LASP has become uh, so capable and so comprehensive in its abilities. And the, you, the people who, uh, uh, who make all this possible, are uh, to be congratulated so much. The uh, involvement of 
uh, literally hundreds of students, over time thousands of students who have gone through LASP and who have learned the trades here. The uh, scientists, the engineers, the managers, the, all the folks who make this possible, uh, it's really been a, an extraordinary thing. Uh, how does this shape up with respect to um, the campus as a whole? Uh, CU uh, has become a, a pretty much a powerhouse in uh, funded research. Uh, the CU campus, about uh, half a billion dollars of, uh, of research. LASP uh, does about a quarter of that or so. The research institutes are, are really the, the strong place for, for getting award dollars and uh, many of you are well aware of that and together um, in the um, geosciences, in the uh, earth and space sciences and uh, environmental sciences, together LASP and Ceres are really uh, dominant in that picture. And when you look at the uh, proposals, it is also quite a, an amazing thing um, how the two institutes propose so many things and uh, uh, totaling so, so much money. And now we're looking beyond uh, federal funding to many other innovative things of the sort that we're uh, engaged in here in LASP. So diversifying the portfolio is going to be very important for the future. And uh, I just want to highlight just a, a few things again, uh, maybe bear repeating for some of the things that just have happened in the last couple of years or so. Uh, with Amal Chandran and Mike McGrath uh, really developing the International Space Program in Research and Education, INSPIRE, we have now uh, well over a dozen allies around the world, universities that are working with us on small CubeSat kind of class missions uh, to, uh, to really use the uh, LASP experience in, in uh, designing and developing small spacecraft and, and sort of exporting that knowledge to, to the rest of the world and bringing that science interest from those folks back to university. Voyager success, the Cassini grand finale uh, back in September of 2017. They, uh, I can't say good enough things about the total solar irradiance work, Peter Paluski and his team, uh, the uh, success in doing the, this work on free flyers on the International Space Station and any other platform that can make itself available. This is a, a really an amazing program and uh, I'm so delighted that Richard Eastis is here and that the gold program is, is now well underway and that it's returning uh, first scientific results. And this, uh, again, is an innovative way of flying instruments on board uh, commercial satellites and a pathfinder for NASA. And uh, Frankie Parvier and the GOES team, the EXIS team, have been continuing their outstanding work and have more. This, I think, is the program, as far as I know, it's the longest running. I think it's guaranteed to run until 2035. So I hope we'll all be back for that, uh, that event. <laughs> But uh, it's been a delight as well to have Kevin France join us and, and intensify our rocket program, uh, not only for planetary but for astrophysical studies as well. And of course, Tom Woods and the uh, EVE team uh, doing the uh, calibration flights for underflights. And uh, finally, let me say that uh, space weather is, a, is a, a broad, it's a team sport, it's a broad enterprise here in the uh, Colorado Front Range. and. Uh, Tom Berger, Jeff Thayer, and many others who have joined forces to put together the Technology Research and Education um, Grand Challenge program called TREK. And uh, I'm delighted that LASP is playing a role, a, a significant role in that, and that we're going to uh, use this opportunity uh, between engineering, science, and, uh, and operations to really push forward and to make um, Boulder in the front range even more uh, broadly and, and deeply known for space weather accomplishments. So I'm, uh, I want to uh, leave a little bit of time for people to correct all the errors that I've made here after my talk, but I would just like to say that I think um, while we've accomplished a great deal, uh, while all of you together have accomplished a great de uh, deal over the past decades, um, I think there's very bright future and uh, I believe that there are many many opportunities it's not going to be without challenges 
Um, we see that there's a constantly changing federal environment. There's probably much more of a push in this present administration toward applied research rather than fundamental research alone. But uh, I th as I've tried to indicate with things like space weather, I think the opportunities are great there and that we can uh, do very well in this environment. We, can, we have produced many things. Uh, we want to make sure that we sustain and maintain our capabilities and that we um, use the wonderful machine that we've built here for the betterment of uh, science and, and humankind. I think there are many opportunities, uh, probably more than ever, for cooperative um, work and, uh, and great advantage. Uh, we live in, a, in a, an amazing ecosystem that I've talked about. The aerospace environment here, with Lockheed Martin and Ball and many of the large companies, but, but the uh, almost countless uh, smaller companies that are working in the space sector really offer us a unique advantage and we should take advantage of that. And of course, there's the, the increasing international demand. And I'm so delighted that um, international partners beat a path to our door, but also entrepreneurial, uh, philanthropic organizations are coming our way. And so we may well have a very di a different portfolio and mix, mix of, of uh, income streams, but I think we're going to continue to do great science. So we have a tremendous regional capability to compete and win uh, if we can learn to um, cooperate more, become um, um, even stronger partners between government, industry, and academia. I think we can win many, many new opportunities. And we're constantly looking for creative pathways and partnerships, and I think all of you are bringing those to our doorstep. So let me conclude then by saying, I want to say congratulations to all Laspians and to their adherents, uh, to people of the past who uh, made all this possible people at present who are doing an amazing thing and to the younger, I don't see too many little kids here, but I, I, want, I would like to say that I hope that many students and, uh, and uh, younger people in the audience will really be the future of LASP. Thank you all for 70 years of, uh, of accomplishment and uh, let's hope that we, no, let's, let's assume we're gonna have 70 more years of great accomplishment and then some, so thank you all very much. So I don't know if anybody has a question or two. Um, we may have a six minutes to answer any questions. So. Yeah. Do you have a count of the students that last has produced? Uh, not a very good record. We've we've done some. of uh, tried to do that. It it really does run into the thousands of students. But uh, I wish we had a more precise. I wish record keeping had been ba better in the early years. But it's it's really quite an extraordinary, and. Uh, you can, you know, you can go almost anywhere and run into somebody who, uh, at a meeting or something, someone who comes up and says, I was a student at, uh, uh, at LASP. I should stay close to the mic, yes. Um, this is probably off the subject, but what was it like working with Werner Von Braun? Well, I didn't work with Werner Von Braun. I met him once. Uh, the, I, I, um, uh, and I met Werner Von Braun in his office at NASA. And uh, I expected uh, an arrogant and um, maybe sort of insufferable person. And he turned out to be very, very nice. Well, I was with James Van Allen, so he's probably nice to me because of that. <laughs> uh, but, but he actually uh, bent over backwards to ask me what I was doing and, and how I was doing. And um, I was sort of in awe. And I, what I probably said was, really nice to meet you. And that's, so that's the extent of my work with Werner Von Braun. <laughs> Did he speak real good English? He spoke quite good English. Very, very, um, I would say, very clipped kind of German. He, he had a, a very uh, precise way of speaking. And uh, he was, let's say, a very confident person, and uh, you knew it. <laughs> Other questions? So, yeah, Tom Mason's supposed to ask me a question. What? Well, Dan, thanks for this great summary. Um, it was very well done. And, um, well, you did it, so thank you. <laughs> thank yourself. <laughs> I did, and yeah. A lot of other universities attempt to do this kind of work, and I was just wondering, as far as you're concerned, one of the keys to the machine that LASP has built 
functioning as well as it does? Yeah, it's, well, I, you know, there are a lot of maybe happy accidents. I, I remember a story told about Sam Walton. Some of you may have heard me tell this before, but he was a person of notoriously few words. He's the founder of Walmart. A reporter was talking to him and said, uh, Mr. Walton, you've been so successful. What do you owe your success to? And he said, good decisions. <laughs> and the reporter said, yeah, but how did you learn to make good decisions? He said, bad decisions. <laughs> And, and so um, I sort of think that, um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to have a lot of brilliant people, a lot of dedicated and hardworking people who've made good decisions. There are probably a number of bad decisions I didn't uh, point to in this talk and, and we don't want to dwell on. But uh, by one means or another, all those good decisions, I think, have piled up to uh, lead to this extraordinary capability. And so... Again, I'm, I just marvel when I think back over just the period of time that I've been here, um, how many great ideas have been brought to our doorstep one way or another, and uh, the success that people have had in carrying out those ideas. So, I, again, I just I have to say thank you to everybody here. Any other? One more question, if there is one. Otherwise, let me say thank you again. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks for uh, all the efforts of everybody today. Um, for putting on such a great uh, birthday party for last. But I think I hope we can continue to celebrate this this year throughout the year. We're hoping in the spring that we'll have another major event, perhaps with the NASA administrator here and, and things like that. So we'll bookend this between this uh, beautiful day today and we hope uh, a non-snowy day uh, in March of uh, 2019. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you.